All right, what's going on? We are here. Matthew, chapter, that's not a five, chapter five, uh, part two. Uh, we are knee deep in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and we're going to pick it up here in verse 17. Jesus has already given his uh, Beatitudes. He already he just finished up the part about you know being the salt of the earth, being the light of the world. And now he's going to not completely change direction, but definitely move uh, move on from from the previous verses, and he's going to go into this whole uh, new thing. So um, it's interesting in how he starts this off. He says, uh, "Think not, right? Think not that I came to uh, to get rid of the law and the prophets." Let me read it. Actually, um, some translations say, "Think not," but other. I got New King James in front of me. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So a couple things. Um, One, Jesus is on the scene. He uh, has all these multitudes that are following him. Uh, They're mixed multitudes. It's not just the Jews anymore. Remember, you know, we saw at the end of chapter four. Uh, beginning in chapter five, we we see that the the, the the pagans, some of the pagans from like Syria, from from beyond the River Jordan, they're following him around. They're coming to him to get healed, and uh, and many are sticking around to listen to what this guy has to say. We see uh, we see Mark in chapter one of Mark. Uh, it's it's gonna put a little bit of light onto this onto this statement that Jesus makes. Uh, Mark chapter one verse twenty two says this. The people were astonished at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. So (laughs) the people here are definitely seeing something different about Jesus. The teachers of the day are not able to do what Jesus is doing, and he is teaching with authority. So it's really got their attention. Um, Verse 27 is going to say something very similar. So Jesus here has literally just um, sent a demon out of a man. Uh, verse 26 at this the unclean spirit threw the man into convulsions and came out with a loud shriek in front of an audience so people are like what's going on here verse 27 all the people were amazed and began to ask one another what is this a new teaching with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him so take these two little uh, verses here from mark and let's plug them back into verse 17 of, uh, of where we're at in chapter 5 of matthew where he says, think not, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. See, they were looking at him. They saw the authority, it, you know, this new teaching, this new thing that's happening. And, and he's backing it up with these miracles and these signs and wonders and stuff, chasing out even demons. They listen to him. It's authority. And Jesus right here uses this authority and this opportunity while they're listening to him to affirm the law of Moses. He affirms it so much that he says, uh, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle. Now, those are, first of all, terrible English words. <laughs> but uh, second of all, they are actually, um, the real translation there is is, is dealing with um, Hebrew letters. So uh, the jot and the tittle are, are English translations of, of Hebrew letters, and, and they're just the tiniest of Hebrew letters. I believe one is almost like a little accent that you would put, like, say, in Spanish, or if you're, like, trying to spell something out in English, like, phonetically, and you have, like, a little accent on, like, what gets the... The uh, stronger um, voice when you speak it. My gosh, yes, phonetics. I, I don't know. Um, you get what I'm saying. But Jesus is saying, not even the smallest little thing in the law is going to be. I'm not going to. I'm not going to remove any of that stuff. We're not throwing any of that out. That's going to be here till the end. Until it's fulfilled, heaven and earth will pass away first before any portion of the law is done away with. Jesus is affirming the law of Moses uh, when he very easily could with his new teaching and his new authorities could have just started teaching something completely different. He does not do that. He shows that this is a a cohesive story from the beginning, the law into Jesus. And of course, Jesus, we're going to see shortly, uh, is going to be the the one who fulfills the law. I want to make a quick note here. Verse 20 says, uh, Jesus says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, those are big words, right? Those are big words because people looked to the teachers of the law and the Pharisees to teach them about the law. (laughs) So, uh, you know, they were looked at as the righteous people of the day. They were the ones that they're supposed to be, people are supposed to be following, right? And Jesus is like, hey, if you're not better than these guys, um, there's going to be some problems. Uh, the, the, The problem itself with that 
is that they were actually pretty good at following the law. They were the ones that were coming up with all these like ideas and like, okay, we're supposed to tie 10%. So let's, you know, take every spice that we have in our garden and tie 10% of like the dill and the cumin and the and the basil and all this stuff. And we're gonna we're gonna weigh out all of our spice, you know, all of our cilantro. And we're going to take 10% of that weight and we're going to put it aside for God because we are going to be that righteous. We're going to follow the law that much. Unfortunately, uh, as Jesus says elsewhere, they, they tithe their mint and their dill, but they completely like forgot about um, mercy and justice and, and all these things. So um, even though on the surface, these guys, the, the scribes, the teachers of the law, Pharisees, even though on the surface, um, they, they are you know, pretty righteous, even according to the law, uh, they're really missing the heart of what the law was trying to convey. Okay, so in this section, we got Jesus uh, starting in verse 21 here. Jesus is going to be expounding on the law. He's going to he's going to bring up the commands and then he's going to take that command and he's going to explain what is really the purpose of that command. Um, for example, uh, thou shall not kill is the first one he's going to mention here. And, and I, I find it a way I, I find it helpful in a way to, to think of what Jesus is doing. Um, like if you're a photographer, I'm not a photographer. You might be, I might even butcher, butcher these terms as a matter of fact, but, uh, there's like foreground and background when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're taking pictures or anywhere, man, in life, right? I can be looking over there and I have a foreground and a background. I have my lights, uh, they're in the foreground. And then in the background, I have the wall back there or whatever is like on my shelves. Uh, so if I'm looking in this direction and I'm looking and I'm focusing in the foreground, I see, you know, the light. But if I refocus my eyes a little bit, you know, and I can kind of like look past the light and get maybe even a more complete picture of what's in my room. I see the shelf. I see a couple things in the shelf. I see the wall over there. And this is kind of, <laughs> it's kind of what Jesus is doing with the law because, because he's looking at thou shall not kill. And that's in the foreground, right? That's the commandment. Thou shalt not kill. And the focus is on that. That's that's what he's looking at. But when he turns the, the lens a little bit of his uh, his perception, turns the, the lens a little bit, he's bringing into focus not just the command, which is the fruit, but actually the anger, which is the root, right? So murder is the fruit, if you will, but turns that lens and he shows us what the root of that command is really about, which is anger. And then he brings that out and he's going to show everybody here, like what the real purpose and fulfillment of that command is about. Thou shalt not kill is just, it was never intended to be just about killing. It was intended to, to bring something along with it, uh, the heart motive with it. And now Jesus is going to lay the heart bare in front of everyone. And it's, it's going to, it's going to be very interesting. So we have here, uh, verse 21, you have heard that it was said of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry, right? So he's already gone from thou shall not kill and he's brought up to anger. So people listening to this are probably like, okay, <laughs> is that a leap or, or, or is this really like the root of what that command was trying to get at? Uh, and as Jesus kind of explains a little bit more, it's going to become more and more clear that, yeah, maybe the root of murder is anger. And Jesus is going to make it very um, uh, applicable. It's going to make it very down to earth for them to, to see. So, uh, and for us to see as well. I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother, right? So when you're thinking thou shall not kill, you're probably not thinking about your brother unless you're, uh, you're Cain and Abel, you know, back in Genesis. Uh, if somebody's going to kill somebody, a lot of times it's, it's it's an enemy, right? It's an enemy. But Jesus is 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 making this like uh, people on even footing here. It's your brother, right? It's your brother. Uh, he's purposely going to use that word, brother, brother, brother. I say to you, whoever's angry with his brother, 
without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, maybe yours says without a cause. Some don't say, some manuscripts don't say without a cause. So we'll read it. Whoever's angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So Jesus is like, hey, if you are in a uh, argument with somebody, if you're if you're getting at it with each other and you start to use these words, if you start to call somebody a fool or an idiot, it's like this like escal- escalation thing. It's like you're angry. Now you're yelling these words at somebody. Now you're saying these words to somebody and you're escalating it and you're getting closer, right? You're getting a little bit closer to the, to the, the fruit that was the command of do not kill. You get in danger, you're getting in danger here. So uh, I, I love what Jesus does here with this next part. He says, therefore, right? If you bring your gift to the altar, if you bring an offering, right? A gift to the altar would be an all, uh, an offering to God. If you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember, right? Before the Lord, <laughs> there you remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So Jesus is like, this This is no joke. This is no joke. First of all, you know, the command is thou shall not kill, brings it down to anger, <laughs> equates it with uh, anger with the brother. And then, you know, it says it goes, starts with anger and then it escalates with like words and you're an idiot, you're a fool, you're a moron and uh, back and forth. And then he says, even, even more than that, like if you were to have this kind of a, kind of a conflict with your brother and you go and you're trying to bring an offering to the Lord and there you remember, Hey, this is my brother back here. And, and we got this thing going on straight up. It's not even worth it to leave your offering to, to bring your offering to the Lord. It's like, it's like, leave it there leave it there. It's of utmost importance. It's more important than the offering that you're bringing to the Lord. Leave it. Go and be reconciled, right? Remember uh, the Beatitudes from just a little while ago? Blessed are the who? Are the peacemakers, right? And the peacemakers. Leave it. Go be reconciled to your brother and then come back and bring your offering. So it's important to note that under this kind of fulfilled uh, interpretation of the law, uh, you know, I got the command, thou shalt not kill. Well, I've never killed anybody before, right? Says the Pharisee, I've never killed anybody. Oh man, I've been I've been pretty good as far as righteousness goes according to the law. Jesus is like, well, you ever been angry with somebody? You ever called them a fool? Uh, yeah. So Jesus is, is is in a way bringing the command into focus, right? It's not about did you kill somebody yet? Have you killed anybody? It's about you ever been angry with somebody. And then we find that uh, we, in our hearts, we have absolutely broken that law. We have, we have broken that command. And Jesus is, is making this case that uh, we're all on the same footing. It's not the Pharisees are better than everybody else because they're good at keeping their law or whatever. It's that every single one of us is on equal footing because we have all been lawbreakers at heart. So yeah, Matthew 529, uh, it's a toughie. People have misinterpreted this thing plenty of times over the ages and done some pretty silly things in light of that misinterpretation. 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. Pluck it out and cast it from you. That's really the, 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 the sense here. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So on one hand, uh, I think it's about the extreme of sin or whatever is causing you to stumble. Like, like whatever that it is, you need to drastically get rid of it. Drastically get rid of it. On the other hand, uh, I think to follow this literally, um, it's pretty clearly foolish because where does where does sin come from, right? Does it come from your eye? If you're, if, if you're looking at a man or a woman to lust after them, like is the sin coming from your eyeball? If you are, you know, angry and you're punching somebody in the face with your right hand, is that sin coming from your right hand? Right? It's not. So Matthew 15, 19 says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. And these are what defile a man. So I think that it's really trying to get at the heart of the matter, if you will, no pun intended. It's really trying to get towards where does sin come from? And uh, and you see, you know, right there, right, right, right in the center of us, something that we have to deal with. So Jesus here, verse 31, um, 
this is going to be a different kind of command that he brings up because this is not a negative command. It's not, you know, thou shall not do this or that. Thou shall not, you know, kill. Thou shall not commit adultery. Now we've got um, something that was actually permitted under the law that Jesus is going to, you know, uh, bring into better focus. And we're going to see that it was only permitted uh, because of hardness of heart of the people. So it's about divorce. Um, Furthermore, it's been said, 31, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Moses permitted in, in the law divorce. But I say to you, Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. So if the Pharisees were not mind blown by now, they are surely pushed over the edge with this one. Because for centuries, you know, according to them, like righteous Jews like themselves have been able to uh, divorce their wives if they weren't happy with them and, and let them go as long as they gave them a certificate. And Jesus is like, nah, that only happens. And we'll see uh, later on in Matthew chapter 19. Uh, he's actually being questioned in Matthew chapter 9 by the Pharisees. And he responds to them. He's being questioned about um, marriage. He responds to them, says, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of your hardness of heart but it was not this way from the beginning so that was not the original design so we see the command uh, meets the jews kind of where they're at and unfortunately the, the pharisees and the teachers of the law have really uh, taken where they were at uh, to be the fulfillment of the law and, and it wasn't even close like jesus is showing up and just bringing everything into this this way better focus, and um, and these guys are just unable to handle that kind of change of pace. So Jesus is going to go on. He's going to expand on a couple other commands. He's going to do the same formula, like, "Hey, you've heard this, but I tell you that." He's gonna he's gonna take the the fruit, you know, of the command, which is you know, murder or adultery, and he's going to continue to uh, change that focus and deepen that perspective till it gets to the heart and the root intention of what that law was all about in the first place. You see, Jesus and only Jesus was able to, to really expound on the law and show the law for what it really, really, really was. The Pharisees and the, and the teachers of the law, they, they, they weren't, they were missing it. They were missing the heart behind the law. They had made it into something else and twisted it into something that it was never intended to be. And now Jesus lights itself right jesus has has shown his light on the law and and now you see that the law only makes sense and can only be complete and fulfilled in jesus so how does our righteousness how, how can we have righteousness better than the pharisees it's by looking at these commands that jesus has set forward and understanding that you might even you know get through your life without uh you know killing someone or without committing physical adultery but but there are key things key themes key key heart attitudes behind these commands that there's no way that we could ever fulfill and every single one of us every single one of us is in need of a savior we can't pat ourselves on the back and say hey we tithed our dill and our cumin and our cilantro like we are all set in front of a, in front of god no, our righteousness has to be better than that. And and the ironic thing is that our righteousness is only found when we fall on our face in front of Jesus and say, we absolutely cannot do this, Lord. Help us. Help us, Lord. Help me to have eyes with integrity. Help me to have a heart that 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 seeks after you. Help me to, to, to control my impulses and help me to be a peacemaker and help me to, to see, you know, the image of God in other people so I don't look down on them or look to, to get... Um, selfish gratification from them or, or whatever that it may be. Only in Jesus are we able to uh, rest. Only in Jesus do we find the fulfillment of the law.